Welcome to the Eminent Midnight Show, folks. My name's Tony, and I'm coming to you from New Zealand, though my guest on the show today is actually in England. I want to offer a warm welcome to James Musker on the Eminent Midnight Show. We've had James on a few times, and James, the other times you've been on the shows, I've had such good feedback. I've said to so many people that your book, um, which you can tell people again your, the name of in a minute, is a must-have for anyone that's studying these types of topics. So it's great to be talking to you again today. So tell them uh, the name of the book and everything just quickly as well. Yes. Uh, thank you, Tony. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's great to be here back on A Minute to Midnight. The book is called The New World Religion and the Beliefs of the Elite. And today we're going to be looking at um, the beliefs of the elite section of the book. That sounds really good. I think it's important uh, for people to understand what the actual beliefs are so they know where, where they're trying to go with them. That's right. Well, it, it is complex and we can't pretend to have all the answers to this. But uh, I don't have some secret source of knowledge that I'm privy to. I'm not able to claim that I know illuminated Freemasons at the top of the elite. Um, but what we're going to do is look at some evidence based on concrete pointers and indicators to the religion of the elite. Look at that evidence and not jump to any conjectural comments or try to overstate the mark. We'll start with the obvious to set the foundation and then move on to the more esoteric, hidden, spectacular pointers to the hidden government. And at the end, we'll make some conclusions based on that evidence and further pointers that you can follow up on to the religious beliefs of the elite who are really running us. That sounds great. OK, so the elite themselves, have they said anything? Has anyone actually asked them? Yes, they have. Um, we've got the interviews that Tim Russett did. He asked George Bush and John Kerry in two separate interviews, what it meant um, for America that they were both in Skull and Bones, because you know about Skull and Bones Society, it's well worth researching. And George Bush replied to that question, it's so secret, we can't even talk about it. Well, that was a pretty a slightly flippant reply. Um, and John Kerry was also asked by Tim Russett that both he and George Bush Jr. were running for the 2004 presidency and both were in the secret uh, society of skull and bones. He replied to the question, what does it mean for America? He said, not much, because it's a secret. Hey. Uh, he then said, <laughs> really funny. He then said, I wish there were something secret that I could manifest, which seems a bit of a strange reply to me. Hmm. And so... Yeah, it's interesting, got, though, that they yeah. do the flippant replies... That, that's so often what they do, that you, to make people that don't believe a conspiracy, you laugh it up and make a joke out of it. Yes. Well, and there was that chap who got tasered for asking that question about Skull and Bones, wow. who's a stu student. But uh, if you're having secret society meetings, could it be that you have something to hide? hide? Um, and what part of that secret is that they love war and death. And that, for a start, is one secret that they don't want you to know about. Mm. And secondly, we've got a little bit more evidence in a Fox News interview with Newt Gingrich, who said that Donald Trump was not part of the club in a secret society. And I quote, paraphrase, that he was an outsider. He's not part of the club. He's uncontrollable and hasn't been through the initiation rites. He didn't belong to the secret society, and I think they have no idea how to relate to him. So here we have it, a bit more evidence that our politicians are in secret societies. And I, I mention this really obvious evidence because you might be having conversations with your friends who categorically refuse to even contemplate that politicians belong to secret societies that's too implausible for them. So this is a great starting point to helping them understand what's going on today. Our politicians are in secret groups, and that means that they do secret things. And as we'll see a bit later on, by extension, they believe themselves to be better than the man on the street. And they believe 
things that many people would think ridiculous or even stupid, like worshipping strange gods or such as Skull and Bones members saying, Satan is death, death is death, and things like this at their initiation ceremonies. So, mm, yeah, sounds interesting. I'm looking forward to this. Yes, <laughs> well, well, we'll keep going looking at the evidence. So, the fa- very fact that members of parliament are in secret societies, in my opinion, totally changes the idea that they are representatives of the people for the people. They're out for their own interests. So, looking historically at probably one of the most important secret societies that we have good evidence about, we have the Milner Group. And this was started by Cecil Rhodes around 1900. And in that, uh, you have the legacy of the secret society of the elect, is what the group was called. It was called different things at different stages. But you've got Alfred Milner and Cecil Rhodes. um, And the core inner members of the uh, junta of... uh, the secret society were William Stead. Well, you've got, you got Cecil Rhodes. He was a Freemason. William Stead was a theosophist. Reginald Brett, second Viscount of Escher. He was an atheist. And then uh, Baron Nathan Rothschild. He's an Ashkenazi Jew. And later on, Alfred Milner, uh, who died in 1925. He was a Freemason. These men formed the inner core of the group. And from this group, we have the Royal Institute of International Affairs and the Council of Foreign Relations. And from them, the IMF, the uh, UN, the EU, etc. They have basically formed the uh, main backbone of the society and the political institutions that we have today. But they started um, from this group that Cecil Rhodes had, and it was a secret society based upon Jesuit and, to a lesser extent, Freemasonry ideas. They started World War I, and that's pretty much a fact. Um, the, and the idea of going back to Germany actually goes back to before the creation of the Cecil Rhodes group. In fact, it goes back to around 1880. And so this indicates that there was a higher group above the Milner group. And so this concept of rings of power within rings of power and secret societies within secret societies is the correct hypothesis, and it can be backed up by that little bit of evidence there. So the structure of government that the Milner Group espoused is based on Plato's ideas of a ruling elite being at the top, with the police force enforcing those rules and drone workers doing all the work, the slaves at the bottom. So to get there to their agenda, they use whoever they can, be they good or bad. They totally lack morals. They are pragmatists, which means they are focused on reaching their goals and willing to cut corners to get there. And the group think that their cause is so high and ordained by God that democracy or the will of the people doesn't come into it. They don't care. They're they're just arrogant in the extreme. And personally, I think that this sort of cutting corners and not going through the process of government, which has been set up by the people for the people and cutting, going around that makes them, in my opinion, complete maniacs because they subvert the political process entirely by making under the table agreements to bend the direction of policy into their direction for their agenda, but only theirs. And their agenda is completely different to the agenda of the broad masses who they basically despise and hate. They think that we're not able to run ourselves. And so the secret elite, they kill people, they break laws and generally do whatever they want. And because they control everything, no one can do anything about it. And this is the big problem yeah, that, that I have. And this comes from the writings of Professor Carol Quigley, who released this information. He justifies the secret elite as being good for humanity because maybe the results have been acceptable. That's slightly reading between the lines, but actually the results have not been as good as he makes out. Yes, they may have advanced material wealth 
in an unprecedented period of stability since World War II, but they created the two world wars yeah. and a lot more. In fact, the rumours, the wars and the rumours of war have all been derived from this tiny subversive group, which, in my opinion, is, is still in existence. Carol Quigley's book, uh, Tragedy and Hope, goes up to about 1966 uh, and um, not much beyond that. But the in England, most of the politicians uh, are coming from the Oxford University. And it just so happens that that was the recruiting ground for the Milner Group. And so now we're in a global economy which is top heavy with debt and uh, just about to topple over at any moment that they see fit yep. in a completely unstable yeah, economic model. Yes. Deliberate. So absolutely. It's yep. been designed that way. And it's not the case that like a household that they've overspent. It's really the case that the governments have put us into debt on purpose to put power for the central bankers and the private owners of money creation. Totally agree. So, yep. Yeah. And it just so happens that the Bank of International Settlements, that is really the apex of the system, um, the BIS president was Gates Mag Magara, who was previously the president of the Chase Bank, which is the Rockefeller Bank. Yeah. So just a little bit more evidence there. Mm, so, very interesting. So what what is it that sort of ties part of it all together? Well, the most easily discernible common beliefs between all of the groups is Freemasonry. Well, that's interesting. But, that sorry that you mentioned that fr that it's Freemasonry. And previously, you said that that these people believe that they are ordained by God, and you know that they're yeah. so above everyone else because and arrogant. And you know, I just recently interviewed a um, anonymously. Uh, a former 32nd degree Freemason, he basically said straight out that the belief, the God that they have is Lucifer, definitely Lucifer. So we're not talking about the God of Christianity. We're talking about Lucifer as the God that they ultimately have. So and that's straight from yes. the horse's mouth from one that was there. Yes, absolutely. So their strange secret rites and religious meetings that they have um, offer an alternative plan of salvation in which they are gaining more and more light and the candidate is taken from place to place until he arrives at the, the sort of symbolic center of his being and that is luciferianism and it goes back to the enlightenment and illuminati days back in uh, 1782 the congress of wilhelmsbad which was when the illuminated principles of the Illuminati were integrated and interwoven in high level Freemasonry. And this is why the secret elite are far above Freemasonry. The elite are the grand masters of the grand masters, and they are only allowed into the higher degrees if they have a few billion dollars or pounds in the bank and can keep the secrets of the hidden controllers. So, the secret elite nowadays, the, the beliefs of them are actually quite far removed from the Bavarian Illuminati who practiced back in 1770s, 1780s, what would seem to us a fairly watered down version of Illuminism. But what is true, and I think highly relevant, is that the Bavarian Illuminati set the precedent and set up the new master blueprint for the overthrow of the world's political structures. And they early on perfected the original concepts of the deep mole and what we would call a slow method of Fabianist infiltration. So the, at the top, we have Freemasonry and those ideas came out during the Enlightenment and at the same time, the concepts of empiricism, which is uh, the theory that states that knowledge comes from sensory experience alone. So empiricism emphasizes the role of empirical evidence in the formation of ideas rather than innate ideas or traditions. And these concepts went forward within high level Freemasonry, far above the normal Freemasonry that we can see. And so 
part of the belief system that they have is that the end goal of this form of illuminated Freemasonry is apotheosis, which is when you become a divine being. That's their occult term for it. And it comes from the Greek word, which means to deify or make divine. And so it's the idea that they will become deified, the deification of the initiate to the divine level. And it refers to the individual being raised to godlike st stature. So another way of looking at this, and to cut to the chase, really, and get to the conclusion, is that it means they want to take us into a transhumanistic world, um, that they become the masters and the god, and we become the genderless drone workers in their new world order, robotic society, their scientific dictatorship. And so... This idea of being God, it goes back to the ancient world, to Greece and Egypt and Rome as well, that the rulers were said to be worthy of worship. And these concepts of apotheosis, where they come from, and that uh, it's linked in with the mystery religions of those times. So they all contain that idea. And Luciferianism is the belief that through knowledge, they will come to conquer the world and that uh, Satan in Genesis did mankind a favor by providing the Promethean knowledge that enabled man to escape from the Garden of Eden and the petty clutches of, of God in their view. So it's based on a twisted commentary of Genesis and that we can only know everything through the senses. Um, even though we can only know a very small percentage of what's really out there and see a small percentage because of, you know, light and all of that. So let's move on to the next evidence. Evidence uh, four, we've got Bohemian Grove. And so this, <laughs> this is a slightly laughable, <laughs> well, not laughable, but it, it is a bit of a joke, I suppose. You've got these U.S. Republicans, you've got the Democrats, you've got upper echelon businessmen. Uh, they all meet up for two weeks in July in the uh, in California, as you know, and they pretend to worship or have respect for Molech, the Ammonite um, Old Testament God mentioned in Kings, 1 Kings. And um, they um, conduct this ceremony called the Cremation of Care. It's when a, a horse-drawn carriage carries a body it's a coffin to the foot of a 40 foot high owl and the same symbol that just happened to be used by the Bavarian Illuminati. And they, they chant things and there's only one goddess and only one true deity who can help us is what they say. And then the owl starts by saying to them that they have to put their, uh, their concerns in dull care and then burn dull care. And a thunderbolt is thrown down, which is a firework. And it's all a sort of play that happens. And then the owl says, give me that effigy. You've got to burn it right now and I'll take care of all your problems. And so for 15 days, 200 of the world's richest men get together in a slightly homosexual sort of meeting. And, um, you know, they've got their summer $10 million bonuses. Can't they go off to their, you know, <laughs> Barbados with their family or go mountaineering or no, because <laughs> they've got to have a... You know, if you, if you want to have a party, you get an owl and you burn a coffin. It's great fun. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> and it's go. been going on for a long time. This is, you know, yeah. 100 plus years kind of thing. And, I mean, there has been some talk that the, I, I, you, I don't know if there's any truth in it or not, that it hasn't always been an effigy that's been burned, you know, but who knows? Yes. yes. Well, they're, they're into sacrifice and um, that's part of their religion. Um yeah, they, they jokingly call it Bilderberg West, don't they? Mm. So, so right, evidence five. We've got symbols, um, and symbols are a way of conveying deeper truth to us that we can't understand because we're not privy to all the information. So it's, it's a method whereby complex ideas and concepts um, that only initiates can understand that they can see. So it's a sort of secret message. And 
Obviously, you've got the $1 bill. Everyone knows about that. The pyramid on the top. You've got the phoenix as well, or the eagle. You've got serpents, dragons, reptiles. You've got the owl, which you've looked at. You've got the goddess of the flaming torch. Um, you've got obelisks. You've got bees and, and a hive. All of those items are their symbols that they like to uh, put out there for us to uh whether we understand them or not it doesn't matter they still believe that they gain power over us by those symbols yeah and of course one of the you know most obvious ones where you can see a lot of them well apart from in masonic temples which there's plenty of them in there um but the supreme court building in jerusalem uh which is completely full of illuminist symbolism in every which way you look at it really um, designed by the Rothschilds and paid for by the Rothschilds, and um, it is really one place to look if you want to see yes. how they, you know, they've got everything laid out in terms of uh, following all the symbolism right up to the degrees and and whatnot, and the pyramid at the top, and it, 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 just every aspect of it. Absolutely, the the pyramid with the eye is just a dead giveaway, isn't it? And it yep. was donated by um, Dorothy de Rothschild, who. Married at age 17, uh, Jimmy de Rothschild, um, in, uh, who was born in 1913. So they're definitely something worth looking at there. And you've got the next evidence is you've got the EU Parliament building in Strasbourg, which is the unfinished Tower of Babel based upon the painting by the medieval artist uh, Bruegel. The construction of the EU Parliament just happens to be directly in the image of that painting, which mm. is the Tower of Babel. And it sends the message that Nimrod had the right philosophy and that his Tower of Babel was a good idea. Yeah. Many, it says, uh, there are many tongues, one voice was, was the mantra. Well, that's straight out of Genesis chapter 11. Yeah. So no surprise to see the EU on the path of total tyranny and the elimination of the worship of God and basically their ideas of bringing us into their Luciferian society. And mm. they just happened to have a, most of those elite uh, had a meeting at the, the Gothard uh, tunnel ceremony. Have you, have you seen that, Tony? Yeah, that was totally freaky. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. the weirdest thing ever, wasn't it? Absolutely. It was the, an, an inauguration ceremony for the opening of, of uh, one of the world's longest tunnels. And Angela Merkel and France's president, Francoise Hollande, were there. Uh, Matteo Renzi, the Italian prime minister, etc. It's the most odd display of gyrating actors and semi nude people and Satan dressed up uh, and beasts and all, all of this. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> And it would have cost an absolute fortune to put that on too. Um, yes. It's just the b most bizarre thing. It was certainly an initiation ceremony. Yes. We can't quite understand. We can decode a lot of it, but we can't quite understand why they're bothering to do that. But uh, I'll come on to that towards the end, that we could be props in their system, but that's what they'd like us to believe anyway. Right. The next one is a films that they like to flood us with imagery um, from their world, but all the time denying it's actually them and it's part of their social engineering. Um, the themes that they're generally preparing us for are a dystopian world, I'm afraid to say. They're preparing us for transhumanism and being genderless drone workers for the scientific dictatorship. And doesn't that go all the way back even as far as Metropolis, the the movie from, not was it 1927, I think, from, from memory? Oh, yes. You know, that, it's yes. all there in that film, right back as far as then. And, of course, you know, that was, for its day, incredibly sophisticated, that film. It's amazing what they actually did, uh, you know, in, in that day and age. But, um, and, of course, it's just carried on and, and more and more through the, you know, years since. Absolutely. Absolutely. We can see it there in the films and, obviously, Eyes Wide Shut. Yeah. Um, uh, which is a the cutout scenes are worth looking at, and the Rothschild Ball in 1972. Yeah. We can see lots of strange imagery, Illuminati symbology, 
and even cam- cannibalism, mock cannibalism. Yeah. There was a cake. Um, so, right. Let's move yeah. on to evidence six, uh, numerology. Um, we're not going to cover this because we've spent this covered in the book quite a lot. Nine eleven, and the number 93 and Thelema. And, um, and then that leads on to false flags and perhaps to a lesser extent hoaxes. And um, Pythagoras is one of the darlings of their beliefs. And he expounded some elements of numerology, I suppose, well, more like mathematics. But his statement was all is number. He was very into uh, that. So this is making the link to the Greek mystery religions back in the 6th century BC. Right. So evidence seven, paedophilia and the lack of accountability that Every time there is a substantiated claim, it is after that person has died, just about. Mm. I, I don't want to go into that area since David Icke and many others have explained it before. Um, but there is a lot of evidence that the top secret elite really are into this abhorrent, evil, deviant behavior. So you can look at that in your own time. Evidence eight are the writings of the conspirators themselves. And um, I've mentioned this in the book in chapter 14, mainly from the point of view of the occultists who are linked in with the UN and this concept of um, evolution and us going forward into their paradigm shift. And I think it's a really important point to to know about because practically all of the writers even economists they all and Al Gore for example they all mention that there is very obliquely some of them that there's an ultimate goal goal that they're heading towards and it is not democracy and individual freedom it's the great plan which they have spoken of for hundreds of years basically the one world government the coming of their messiah and the oblique expression of the idea of becoming gods all of which leads us to think that these occult concepts that we can see, that this is what they're really into. They're really into this idea of the paradigm shift, such as the Omega point that Teilhard de Chardin mentioned in his books, or, or the Luciferic initiation of David Spangler, who works, worked for the UN. And the other writing that's well worth looking at is the Protocols of Zion, who, uh, where you can see that they're pretending to be Jewish, but really they're a totally different religion, which is a high, high level form of Luciferianism or Freemasonry. They are the synagogue of Satan. They're pretending to be, to be Jews, but probably they're not. But mm-hmm. then they gloss it up as if they are. So, you know, yeah. that's the way that things are done. So we'll just conclude on some of these um, points then, shall we, Tony, that yeah, 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 yep. I just was thinking what we're seeing just before you go on is just going yeah. through my mind is just a convergence of books like Brave New World and 1984 all sort of being rolled into one thing <laughs> at the moment. That's right. It's a scientific dictatorship or in its modern form, it's a technocratic uh, economy based upon the technocracy of the 1930s that was brought forward by the intellectual Zbigny Brzezinski, who was the mentor of David Rockefeller. And this is the type of um, information surveillance state where they have to balance the electrical load. And this is why um, they have to put smart meters everywhere so that they can balance the electricity. It's linked into that and their scientific dictatorship, and also the new world religion taking us into their society where we really will be so dumbed down that we will follow whatever dictates that they want. And also there's the the, the Luciferian satanic aspect behind it. Hmm. So um, we've looked at a little bit at Py- Pythagoras, numbers, Plato, their f- political ideology, that they wish to become gods, and that comes from Egyptian and ancient Greek religions, and Luciferianism and Gnosticism. Also Illuminism, that the elite think that they are receivers of special enlightenment, the thousand points of light, 
that they are above the rest and that they are the arrogant titans who can go anywhere, do whatever they want. They're above the law. They like to remain in the shadows, but yet they control practically everything that we see via the media and the writing and the news. And they do this because they don't want anything to get in, their, the, in the way of their plans. And so practically everything we see today is derived in the main from them. In, in some, if some unusual body of information or some movement came forward that it looked like it might derail their plans, they'd be all over it. They'd just get straight on there and use the Hegelian dialect, one side or the other, to control it. Yeah, and censorship, which is exactly what's happening more and more at the moment. And they create events that need censoring, so it gives them the reason to have to censor it so that they can censor everything else that they want censored. If you see what I mean, they, you know, they, they, they are liable to create an, an event and, and a narrative and all that. They go, ah, oh, that's really bad. That's, you know, that's terrible. We have to get rid of that um, in order to protect the public when it's them themselves that have probably created the whole thing. Then they censor that. So that then gives them the, the censorship reasons to be able to censor everything else that comes out uh, that they don't want because they've already set the precedents in place. It's very clever. Yes, it is part of their systems that they seek to control everything from both sides. It's part of the Hegel's uh, doctrine of um, the Hegelian dialect, where you've got a synthesis and then an anti-thesis, uh, um, which makes a synthesis. Yeah, you, so, yeah, yeah, you, sorry, you yeah. just said that. You got twisted a bit. You got a thesis yeah. and an anti antithesis. Um, I'm sure you meant what you meant to say, but it just wasn't yeah. quite what you said. And then they get the synthesis from it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So two high level states, um, two high level statesmen, for example, may put forward two ideas that are contradicting, contradictory, and seemingly the opposite, but they're on the same page. Yeah. They're arriving at the same goal, and so. Hegel, I think, got this idea from the Kabbalah and Isaac Ben Luria, who was the Kabbalist, who talked about the doctrine of dualism, light and dark, good and bad, female and male, sun and moon, etc., and creating a unity and, and, and a managed conflict to create their synthesis, their end goal that they've had and thought of before. So they're very keen on this uh, light and dark concept of um and he hegel by the way was very heavily linked in with the bavarian illuminati he wasn't a member but because he was a bit young but a lot of um the people that he knew and he looked up to their writings some of them were members so he, he and obviously karl marx was heavily uh affected by hegel's belief beliefs uh, so yeah and then of course you got the later on you got Saul Alinsky's um um, rules for radicals, which basically they're all just stemming from sort of expounding Adam Weishaupt's original seven-part luminous plan, really. Absolutely, absolutely. So we can we can see it all. We we know what what they're doing, and um, I'll tell you something else, Tony, that I think is of interest, and that is this doctrine of culpability that they they want to tell us what they've got planned for us yeah. as part of a show of their power and omnipotence and that their their doctrine is so perverse that they have to tell us what they're going to do before they do it yeah and it enables us to sort of buckle under them even more and so they tell their agents be they polit politicians or the top corp in the top corporates um what they're going to do and then they do it and it reduces or could it reduce or absolve them of sin or negative karma which may impact them adversely because they don't believe in the last judgment as such. They believe in the way the feather weighing up the good and the bad deeds. And that's why they're keen on philanthropy because they know they're doing all this other stuff on the side. And so the Georgia Guidestones are an example where we have the, the Stonehenge like monument, which the cryptocracy have carved in stone a bit like the Ten Commandments in many languages. That's, they've done that because they have to tell us. And it's a bit like in the business world, we get that idea that when we sign documents or, com or computer downloads, 
they tell us what we're signing into, but it doesn't matter if we haven't read it or understand, understood it. It's the process of law that we have clicked the button that counts. Mm. And that's a bit like this sort of doctrine of culpability. That's a so, good way of looking at it. Yeah. 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 That's great then, Tony. So the next uh, pointer is reincarnation, that the Freemasonry teaches reincarnation, as does theosophy. But the top elite's version of reincarnation is I think reincarnation into family members, not just anyone. That That is conjecture. Um, but it has been mentioned that they believe that at death, when they come around again, they're able to be reincarnated within the same family. Uh. Yeah, and that's an important point because it helps to explain their multi-generational plan and yes. why they're waiting. Yeah. I'd never so thought they, of that before. That's a really good point. That's Yeah, there's a bit of a light bulb moment. Actually, I hadn't actually thought of that. Well, it is a theory, uh, but I, it's something that I'm really researching, trying to get to the bottom of to see if it's in it, mentioned in any other religion, this concept of reincarnating within the family. Maybe there's some magic ritual that, that you know, I, I don't know. Mm. Um, and I suppose that leads on to spirit possession and Freemasonry has this concept of gaining more light, which is basically receiving more uh, demons. That's the fundamentalist view. And obviously, um, they gain more power by allowing these demons into them, uh, be they demons of intellect, knowledge and rationalism. And by doing ceremonies and rituals, they gain more light and that enables them to control more people and advance their plans. So and this may be why they have um, they live so long. They get the power from Satan. And this is why many of the cryptocracy live a long time, like David Rockefeller. He lived to be 101. Henry Kessinger, he's 95. George Schultz, who's 99. Queen 92, etc. So you can see that by gaining more light in the spirit possession, they might be onto something. But I don't know. I mean, it might be the case that they, they had good health and that they didn't have many stresses in the world. But if I were Henry Kissinger, I'd be stressed out to the eyeballs. But I reckon uh, because they can believe in whatever they like. But yeah, they do come to Hebrews 9.27 that they're going to be judged, appointed man wants to die, and after that comes the judgment. Uh, no reincarnation, sorry, Mr. Kissinger. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a completely false doctrine. And in one small step, well, that becomes a massive step, they do away with the salvation and everything else. So in the last judgment in Revelation 20, you can see that uh, the the the, the you know, at the end of the culmination of history that everyone is judged. It's nothing to do with reincarnation. Yep. Mm. So, yeah. So are we props in their religion? Well, they would like to think that we are <laughs> um, because they are creating the society that we live in. And because they create the society, they are the creators. Um, they want to make us dependent on them. And looking to them for all the answers, be it science, politics, business or economics. And to a degree, unfortunately, we 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 are looking at them. I mean, for example, look at interest rates. We're looking at this interest rate and that. I'm a mortgage broker in the in the UK, so I look at that on a daily basis. They have the entire world economy looking to them for the lead on everything that goes on with borrowing money, financing projects. Um, this is how that they look at us as kind of sheep, sheeple, I suppose. We are the, they are the arrogant titans, as illuminated members of the at the top of the world, um, whilst we are the masses at the bottom, who they can manipulate to believe, think, and behave in any way they want. So they think we are props, but of course they have an overinflated view of their position. So my comment is, don't make yourself a prop in their system. Yes. So. Yeah, yeah, good way, of, good way of saying it. But of course, of course, when they are ready, they'll collapse this current system to bring in their next system, which will be much more controllable uh, than what they currently have. 
with you know oh, that's why I think the whole crypt, cryptocurrencies and all that is a part of what they've got next. Well, they've already told us. Come on, the IMF's yeah. already basically told us that's what it's going to be. Um, yes, you know, central bank run cryptocurrency, and yet one way or another, they will have control of everything. Yeah, it is a very very serious situation. I'm not sure what we can do to rectify the position but in the uk at the moment we've got this brexit situation where people who wanted to leave have been basically betrayed by their own government um and we're supposed to be leaving tomorrow the 29th of march but um really it's a bit like a divorce you know just because you can't come to an agreement doesn't mean you take all the family silver and you know drive off with everything so we better sort it out. But it seems incredible that these conversations that we're having now for Brexit didn't happen like a year ago. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's been a fair bit of warning. <laughs> Absolutely. They've yeah. had plenty of time to sort it out. It's amazing that they haven't um, come to blows, I think. <laughs> well, so, again, maybe it's all part and parcel of the plan, this whole thing, you know, to divide and conquer with the, um, you know, the whole was Brexit ever really a voted thing the way it is, or has it just been another part of the whole plan? And, you know, you have nationalism on one hand and, and the globalism on the other hand, and if you can prove that nationalism is faulty and doesn't work, there's only one other thing that they have as an answer, and that's globalism. Yes, it is. That is, that is the situation that they're, they're taking us into. Um but the the idea and concept that Britain is an Atlantic power is mentioned in Carol Quigley's book, um, Tragedy and Hope. And he says that he wasn't into the idea that Britain was uh, an Atlantic. Uh, yeah, he wasn't into the idea that Britain was an Atlantic power. He thought that Britain should be um, a... European power. In fact, I'm quoting from the Millennium Edition of the book, page 691. I have objected both in the past and recently to a few policies, to a few of its policies, the policies being the secret elite that he's um, explaining, notably to its belief that England was an Atlantic rather than a European power and must be allied or even federated with the United States and must remain isolated from Europe. But in general, my chief difference of opinion is that it wishes to remain unknown. And I believe its role in history is significant, significant enough to be known. So that's a bit of an understatement there. Mm. These people are running the whole of the whole of Western civilization and more. And yet he's saying that, you know, it, it is significant enough that we know about them. But the other the other point there is, is that, you know, he's saying that um, he, he thinks that they are an Atlantic power that the cryptocracy want it to be an Atlantic power, and that's probably why we are leaving the Brexit. So we have choice number one of staying in the EU and going into their super state, or choice number two of being some way federated over to America. And that's what um, George Orwell's uh, map had as well. And maps are quite important to the cryptocracy, and uh, they release some of their information uh, in that manner uh, in, in the... Um, the Economist and some of their publications like that. Mm. So, good. Yeah. Um, I'd like to mention one other aspect that we haven't quite touched upon, Tony, if I may, and that yes. is uh, about sacrifices and that um, we, we think that they their religion is such that it demands sacrifices um, and that in Freemasonry they have the mock ritual of Hiram Abeef where he's hit on the head and buried with within King Solomon's uh, temple, and then he's raised up later by the grip of the lion's paw, the lion being Satan. Um, and so they become new members of Freemasonry. But their real religion demands real sacrifice for Satan, and this is why we have some of their deep state rituals going on, such as 9-11. And this is why they love war and why skull and bones glorifies and revels in death and war. So I'm, I mentioned to you in the previous interview with you, Tony, that perhaps there's no coincidence that the number 
th- of people who died in 9-11 were 3,000. And it just happens to be the number of people um, who were killed at the rebellion in Exodus and then in Samson in Judges and the number who were saved in Acts, uh, where the first conversion was for 3,000. So I believe that number has been chosen as part of their sort of deep mega ritual to take us into their next paradigm. Yeah, so, good point. This is what's going on in the world today. Behind it, we have the elite and their secret mystery Babylon religion. And in the book, I explain how they are controlling people. And it's nothing really like how the mainstream media would want you to consider it. It's far subtler and far more nuanced than you will now do, as I say, or else. Uh, how long do you think the worldwide satanic conspiracy would last if they hadn't sorted out their control systems decades, if not hundreds of years ago, um, since at least 1776 and before? Yeah. And th- this is why all people who are in high office are compromised. They have to be or else uh, it's too difficult to control. And so most of the time, They don't need, in fact, to control people because the agenda is so skillfully set in their direction that policymakers and politicians instinctively know that they have to go along with the agenda or they'll get voted out and lose their jobs. So minor changes um, are only required. So at the end of which, we need to bear in mind that God is sovereign and that God has his purposes that he's working out. Okay. Yes, and that, that's that's a very good point. You know, we've got to actually get our eyes on, I guess, onto Jesus first and foremost. Read the Word of God and study it um, regularly, so we can actually see beyond what is going on, and and allow God to open our eyes to the truth, because there is nowhere else that you're going to find it. Yeah. Absolutely, Tony. It is crucial that we we do that. I'm still going forward with Christ, whatever happens. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's a brilliant thing, knowing the true living God. It's a personal relationship and that we need to seek God and uh, submit to his uh, ideas. So, yeah, I mean, then, we're Tony. all going to have tough times. We all go through them, <laughs> I think, and yeah. you know, times of testing and so on. But really, that's it. To whom else can you go as, you know, <laughs> when Jesus asked the disciples, did they want to leave as well? And you reply, to whom else would we go? Well, there is nowhere else it's worth going. So this is why it's important that we get keep in there and keep sustained, I think, in the word of God. Absolutely. Um, now, just, yeah, can you tell the listeners the name of your book again and how they can get a hold of it? Yes, it's called The New World Religion. And the beliefs of the elite. And it mainly goes into how the new world religion of Luciferianism is being slowly rolled out, it goes into the United Religions Initiative and the UN. And you can buy it on Amazon. I've tried to make it inexpensive. It's there uh, globally uh, in, on, in the US and uh, Japan, America, uh, UK, etc., and um, do please buy it, read it, and uh, you know, do put a review up on Amazon for me. I'd be very grateful uh, if you could do that, and that way, people who are looking, they can see what reviews are there, and it'll help them to, um, you know, buy the book and get that in, get this information out there that it, it deserves. Oh yeah, I totally believe it deserves it. It's a it's an invaluable resource. And, um, and I do try to point people in the direction of it. So, yeah, get a hold of a copy of it, particularly because it's pretty cheap. And I'm certainly glad to have a copy of it. So, yes. Good. Well, thank you again, James, for being on the A Minute to Midnight show. That was another great discussion. And um, I'm sure it won't be the last time. Well, thank you very much for having me, Tony. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and uh, keep the faith, everyone, and uh, don't get too uh, down the rabbit warren of this uh, rather strange subject, but enjoy the book and uh, keep the faith. Yes, absolutely. So thank you again. 
A Minute to Midnight is run 100% by donations. You can actually donate and it's very much appreciated, the people that do, at our website, aminutetomidnight.com. And also you can find our shows there. We put out uh, shows on our website, on iTunes, and also on YouTube. Don't forget to like this video, by the way, if you're watching it on YouTube, and share it. And uh, we also have a community forum on our website which you're welcome to join if you wish to do that as well and the music that is used in the shows is all written played and recorded by me and if you want to download free music you can do so on our website as well I think that's about it for this uh, episode of the show we will catch you again in a few days time with another episode of the Minute to Midnight show God bless, have a great week and we will see you in a few days' time.